Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support the show by becoming a premium member, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash podcast to sign up. Memberships are only $2.99 a month. By becoming a premium member, you'll be able to download episodes onto your mobile device and listen to them commercial-free wherever you go. Also, if you'd like to check out the new Dogman Encounters t-shirt store, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash store and take a look around. Buying a t-shirt or sweatshirt there is another great way to help support the show. As always, thanks for listening. Alright, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Joe. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on tonight, Vic. Oh, thanks for coming on the show. You know, I appreciate it. Joe, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm in my early 40s, uh, living here in South Central Pennsylvania. I'm your outdoorsy type. I hunt, I fish, and I like to go hiking. And I'm into the paranormal. You describe yourself as being an outdoorsman, Joe. Did your encounters change how much you enjoy being in the woods? Oh, I would have to say that I'm much more aware of my surroundings and every sound I hear, I tend to observe it a little more. But as far as enjoying my activities, you know, I still do them. If having your encounters made you more aware of what's going on around you in the woods, then I guess that's a net gain because that's always a good idea. You were reluctant to report your encounters to me. Why was that? Well, I don't know, I guess just being on the air, because I've never been on the air before. I just kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. I mean, once I told my girlfriend about my experiences in the past, she's like, well, why don't you put on Dogman Encounters? I'm like, well, I don't really think my stuff would be interesting enough, or if it would really help anybody. You know, that's one of the things I run into time after time, Joe. Even if you didn't have an interest in coming on the show, if you or someone else had an interest in reaching out to me to share an experience with the dog man with me or experiences, coming on the show, that's not a mandatory thing. Most of the people who contact me about their encounters have no desire whatsoever of coming on the show. So, yeah, even if you didn't want to come on the show, you still could have contacted me and we would have had a nice talk about those experiences. So, I just wanted to put that out there. You think dogmen might be attracted to you. Why do you think that? Well, with my background in the paranormal field, it just seems like spirits are attracted to me. I mean, I would either do an EVP session or take pictures or use a K2 meter, and I would get automatic attention. Sometimes I wouldn't. But with dogmen, I... I don't know if they think I'm not a threat to them, or I don't know. I mean, it bothers me. It just seems like they know where I am, but they really don't go out of their way to terrify me. But they let me know they're around. Well, thank goodness they don't try to terrify you the way they do some other eyewitnesses. Yeah, it can get to be pretty bad when they actually are trying their best to terrify you to within an inch of your life. You just mentioned that spirits seem to be attracted to you. When you were a kid, you had some strange paranormal experiences. Do you think your propensity to see things most people don't see had anything to do with the two dogman encounters you had? Yeah, I believe that's so. Yeah, for some reason, it does seem like certain people are a lot more prone to having encounters. Don't know why that is, but definitely seems like there is something to that. You and your girlfriend were into paranormal things before you had the two encounters we're going to talk about tonight. Please tell us more about what kinds of things you did to pursue your interest in the paranormal field before you had your first dogman encounter. Well, when I was a kid, I had my first paranormal experience when I was about 13. This happened in my house. Uh, The day of this incident, six months prior, my grandmother died. Me being in the hunting, I saw a squirrel in the backyard, and I wanted to shoot it. Well, I went to grab my stepdad's gun, which was a twenty-two, but I 
didn't know where the bullets were. And my sister wanted to see me shoot this squirrel. So we're digging through the cabinet there where the bullets are. And I found a box I was looking for. I went to go grab it. And all of a sudden, I hear this, don't touch that, in my grandmother's voice. And I looked over at my sister, and she just had this look in her eye like she heard it too. And I asked her, did you hear that? And she said, yes. And we ran out of there really fast and ran into our bedrooms and slammed the doors. (laughs) I don't blame you. Would you say having that experience or having the dogman encounters we're going to talk about tonight was more frightening? I would have to say the dogman encounters. Yeah, that does make sense. After all, yeah, you did know your grandmother, and obviously the dogman, that's a totally different matter. Well, the ghost hunting that I did for about 15 years, and, you know, I just didn't have any fear of it. I just went out and did it. Wherever something would happen, I wouldn't jump or have a Charmin moment or anything like that. I would actually be more curious and try to see if it would happen to me again. And that's the way I look at the uh, dog man. I mean, I don't want to go up and, you know, make friends with one or anything, but I'm just very curious about them. I never did understand why people would go into places that were haunted as a recreational hobby, but I guess to each their own, we all have our different interests and passions, so I can't fault you for doing that. Did any of the paranormal research you did before having your first encounter include looking for cryptids, or did you only hunt ghosts? I only hunted ghosts, because the town where I always do the ghost hunting was Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and of course, that's the uh, mecca of ghost hunters. But um, as far as cryptids, I never really was into cryptids. I mean, you know, I heard of Bigfoot, I heard of... Jersey Devil, the Dover Demon, the Loch Ness Monster, but Dog Man, I never really, I mean, I heard of it, but I never took thought into what it was. I thought maybe it was just a dog that just, you know, walked around like a man, but I never pictured of anything like that, walked around or looking like a werewolf. Well, I'll tell you what, Joe, let's get down to it. Let's talk about these encounters you've had. Please give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Back in 91, 92, we were at my grandparents' cabin in Michigan State Park for the 4th of July weekend. You know, it was pretty warm out and humid, but during the nighttime, the mountains would be cold because of the elevation. Well, we had our barbecue during the day. And, you know, we did the uh, horseshoes and just things that you do on a cookout. Well, nighttime came around, and my uncle decided to lay off fireworks out in the road. And this must have gone on for about 10, 15 minutes. So about two or three hours later, my grandfather and I were at the back of the cabin, and... We were out by a campfire. Now, the front of the cabin, it was about 20 feet from the road, and we are on the opposite side of the cabin towards the back. Well, we're just sitting there having a conversation, and we heard what sounded like a woman screaming in the woods across from the front of the cabin. And this went on for about five minutes, so my grandfather said, Let's go walk across the street and check with the lady and see if she's okay. Make sure she's not in any trouble or anything. So we go across the road, and my grandfather knocks on our door, and there she comes to the door, and he asks her, is everything okay? And she's like, oh, yeah, there's no problems. What's going on? And he said, well, we heard what sounded like a woman screaming across the road here and she's like well I do hear that at night but I never really took much concern for it so we go back up to the cabin we continue our conversation around the fire and we heard it again 
So he's like, okay, maybe it's just an animal just making noises. So we crossed the road again, and we heard the sound, and it seemed like it was coming from deeper within the woods. But while we were up at my grandfather's cabin, it seemed to be right across the road from us. So you know, we go back up to the cabin and just uh, do our thing, and we're sitting up there once again, and we heard that sound of what sounded like a woman screaming right across the road again. And my grandfather was like, okay, somebody's messing with us, but we don't know what our intentions are. So he grabbed his thirty eight special, and he gave me a shotgun. And we went down to the road to investigate, and we're just looking around, just trying to see if we can see anything pushing through the leaves or anything. And we heard the sound coming again from deeper in the woods. And he's like, okay, there's something wrong here. Something's not right. So we kept our guns pointed into the woods. We just kept sharing it and hearing it, and it seemed like it was going deeper into the woods until finally we just got tired of it and we went back up to the rear of the cabin and sat around the fire and we just started to ignore the sounds because it just sounded like it was just trying to draw us into the woods. Let's see, 2008, my uncle moved into a house in a small town here in South Central Pennsylvania. You know, it's mostly farmland around here. You have a lot of beef, chicken, pork farms, and you have a lot of cornfields, soybean fields, just all kinds of different farms. Well, he moved into a small farmette, and I helped him move along with my cousins and my aunt. And this was about the middle of June, and it was pretty hot and humid out, and it was a little difficult moving, but we were able to do it no problem. So that night that we got everything moved in, we were all in my uncle's house, and we were just having a few glasses of water, you know, try to rehydrate from during the day. And I'm talking to my cousins and my one cousin's husband, and we heard this heavy panting noise coming from outside. I mean, it was so loud, it was like standing next to a steam locomotive. I mean, all you hear is the... But it was, like, really loud. And my cousin, who was female, was like, what is this? What's going on here? And it just kept getting louder and louder. And she's the kind that really flips out. And she started screaming, get rid of it, make it stop, make it stop. But it was so loud, you could barely hear her screaming. And it just seemed like... It would run away because it sounded like what you would hear when you're at a football practice and the players are doing sprints in the grass. It just sounds like a bunch of people running in the grass. And it seemed like it would run away from the house and you could hear it distance itself with its panning. It was a lot lighter. But then it seemed like it would run back towards the house again and the panting would be so much deeper and louder. And this went on for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I mean, we didn't know what it was, and we were afraid to go up to the windows because we didn't want anything to put its claws or anything through the screen and pull us out through the window. We just didn't know what it was. 2013 is when I saw this thing run across the road. It was the beginning of June, 2013. And the house that we lived in, like what I mentioned in the past story, was in a farm. We lived in an old farmette. And we weren't too far from Route 30 is where I saw this thing. So that night, my girlfriend and I were going to Gettysburg to do some ghost hunting. So we're just going down the road, 
and she was the driver and I was the passenger. As we're getting close to this bar, there's a bar and a house on the left, and about 50 yards down the road from that is a big creek. And on the right side of the road, which I was on, it was a huge turkey farm. So it was pretty dark out. I mean, it was a very thin moon. And we're just going towards Tannisburg, and I see this brown head come right up to the passenger side of the car from the right, running towards the left. And what I saw of it was, and I saw this black eye, these triangle ears that were about two and a half, three inches high. The head reminded me of a boxer, but the head was totally brown. And that's all I saw from then. As it came up through the headlight, it was about six inches from the headlight. And we were going about 35 miles per hour, and somehow we didn't hit this thing. It somehow got to the other end of the road. I mean, down the road, she pulled over, and I got out of the car. I didn't see any damage to the bumper. And there's no hair on it or anything. And I checked the tires. There's no blood or anything on there. There's no impact whatsoever. Not even a hair. So we stopped and we looked at each other. And I was like, did you see that? And she said, yeah, I did. What was that? And I said, I have no idea what that was. So we continued on the Gettysburg and did our ghost hunting session. Well, two weeks later, in the same area, I was by myself at the time, and I was going down the same patch of road towards Gettysburg. It was the same house, same bar, and the same turkey farm. Well, as I was driving, I saw something coming from my right going towards the left, so I slowed down, then I finally stopped. And about eight feet in front of me, what I saw, it just completely blew my mind. And after seeing the head and the eyes and the ears, I recognized it as what I saw two weeks ago. But this time I got a full visual of this. It was about three feet tall. It was running on two legs. The fur was completely brown. And I could see things coming from the top jaw and the bottom jaw. The eyes were as black as you can get. I mean, it just looked like a pit with a shine to it, if that makes any sense. And its arms, or front legs, were about two feet long, and it was reaching forward like it was after chasing something. And its torso, it kind of reminded me of a pug or a pit bull. It was just really muscular. I mean, it wasn't built like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but it looked like a pit bull. And its legs, I could only see the, I would call it the thighs. It reminded me of a kangaroo. I mean, they were really thick. But as far as the feet, I mean, it was running so fast, I couldn't tell if it had hawks or not. I mean, the feet were going that fast. And it had a long, bushy tail about two and a half feet long. But overall, it was completely like a really dark brown color. And as it was running across from me, it happened to look my way for just a moment. Then. It continued on its way. Then, once it got into the grass on the right side of the road, I just saw the moonlight just shine off of its tail. It was just the weirdest looking thing I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I've seen some pretty freaky ghost pictures and some other evidence, but this one, it topped it all. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, I'm sure it was. 
Yeah, I don't think you're ever going to get that side out of your head. Uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. You're right. Oh, I'll bet. Do you think almost hitting that dogman when you were driving down that road was happenstance or premeditated by the dogman you saw? Well, something tells me it was premeditated. Because that first time, I mean, it just ran right in front of us without a care. And the second week when I saw it, I mean, it was coming from the exact same side of the road. And it ran right in front of me. I mean, it didn't even stop. It just kept going. Like, it was just, I don't know. It was just weird. But I'm glad I didn't get out of the car that second time. Because I'm pretty sure mom and dad weren't too far away from it. From the way you describe both of those sightings, it sounds like you think both of them were premeditated. Yeah, they had to have been. It was just, they were just trying to get my attention. Yeah, sounds like they must have been. When you and your girlfriend made it to Gettysburg, did you have a hard time focusing on your ghost hunt, or was it business as usual? Well, it was business as usual, but still, I was trying to think about what I saw. Because I'm that guy, when I see something that I don't know what it is, or I don't understand it, I become obsessed with it. Because, I mean, I just kept thinking about it, thinking about it. But, you know, as far as the ghost hunting, it went on as usual. But still, it was, you know, stuck in my head like it is today. It's just something that will never leave me. But the worst part of it is, is that I didn't understand what it was. I mean. Back then, I didn't know what a dog man was. Yeah, in a lot of cases, the worst part of it is, yeah, like you said, not knowing. Speaking of being obsessed, after you had those experiences, how much research did you put into dog men? Well, from the first encounter to the one in 2013, I was just at a loss. I had no idea what I was looking at. You know, I couldn't put my finger on it. I mean, my girlfriend will tell you, it just took many years to figure out what it might have been. But I never really got into Dogman until March of last year, 2017. And what sparked my interest in the Dogman altogether was a conversation at work. And it was just out of the blue. It's just something that just popped into my head and just started it all. When you did start researching them, Joe, what surprised you most about what you learned? It just surprised me on how much they look like a werewolf and their speed, their agility, and just, it just seems like they can live around us without us knowing until it finally shows up in front of some of us that, just have the misfortune of seeing them. Yeah, there's a lot of things about them that are really hard to understand, but their ability to avoid detection when they want to avoid detection is just so hard to wrap your head around. I think I know the answer to this next question, but would you say you were more traumatized by your encounters or curious about what you saw? I'm more curious. I mean, when I go fishing or if I'm out and about because... At nighttime, my eyes are always scanning the road. I'm always looking for something. But it's more of a curiosity than fear. I mean, even though when I go out fishing, my head's on a swivel, but still, it's just, what are the odds of actually seeing one? I try to think of it that way. Well, apparently pretty high in your case, because you've had so many encounters. Did you find out about any other encounters that happened in the areas where you had yours? Well, what sparked my interest was this guy that I work with, you know, I was talking about fishing and hunting, and he asked me, he's like, have you ever seen a dog man? I'm like, a dog man? I was like, what the heck's a dog man? And he said, a huge wolf-looking creature. I said, it sounds like you're messing with me because I said, I don't believe in werewolves. And he says, oh, my wife saw one night, he said, it made me a believer. And I was like, well, what happened? And he's like, well, she's just driving down the road one night, and she saw something up ahead standing on the side of the road, and she hit her high beams, 
the next thing, though, she gets so close to it, she sees this wolf-type creature run across the road into the woods. And ever since I heard him say that, I mean, I've been more curious about Dog Man. I mean, I checked, I'd always Google Dog Man or social networking, and it just sparked an interest in me. And I just, with the whole ghost hunting thing, got tired of it, so I moved on to cryptids. I mean, at the area where I had my encounter back in 91, 92, there's been Sasquatch sightings back there, too. And there's this one story that I know of back there. This place is called Dead Woman's Hollow. And the story behind that is these two people were staying at a cabin. And when nighttime came around, the couple were out back, and the husband was making silly sounds, trying to freak the wife or his girlfriend out, whoever she was. And something in the woods started to mimic him. And he would make a noise, and it would mimic the exact same noise. But they would shine a flashlight out into the woods because they said when they first heard it, it sounded like it was about 100 yards away and closing. Well, the woman shined a spotlight out in the woods from the direction that the sound was coming from, and she saw two yellow eyes looking back at her. And they were moving from side to side. Then, once they got within the 40 yards, they both retreated into the cabin. And throughout the night, she would hear something walking around outside. She would hear twigs break. And she stayed in the cabin the whole night while her husband slept comfortably. So she goes out the next morning. And, you know, she's trying to make sense of what happened. She went toward that area, and whatever it was, it sounded like it was still there, because she could see where it was the night before, where the um, leaves were disturbed. And once she was looking around, she heard that sound again, and she ran back into the cabin. And this was back in 2015. Did you ever touch base with that man after you had your encounters and let him know about your experiences? I tried, but I don't know. Nobody ever replied to it. Because I've been trying to find people that had experiences in that area and I've been unsuccessful. Yeah, it just works out that way sometimes. Considering your interest in investigating paranormal things, do you have an interest in becoming a dogman researcher someday? Yeah, that has crossed my mind, Vic, because, you know, obviously from the encounters I've had, sure, you know, I'm going to get a little nervous when I hear a noise or I see something, but I'm more curious than anything. So it would definitely be something I could get into in the future. I wouldn't mind doing it. Well, don't lose sight of what curiosity did to the cat. Exactly, because, I mean, there are... Even though I've been lucky with these things, you know, I'm still not going to push it because being a hunter and a fisherman, you know, I've actually encountered predators out in the wild. And one thing I know is, is you don't run and you slowly walk away from it. And, you know, you just do the best you can to avoid it because I see a dog man as a wild animal. You know, it should be respected like any other wild animal. It's just something you just don't mess with. But unfortunately, you have those people out there that were pretty much face-to-face with them. Yeah, if you encounter a dog man and don't respect it, that's when the problems start. One day you asked your neighbor if she had seen anything unusual in the area. Because of the way she responded to your question, you think she might have had an encounter of her own. What gave you that impression? Well, right after my first sighting of the one crossing the road, living in that area, because I lived about one mile from where this happened, in the house that I lived in, it was a two-unit apartment. We lived upstairs, and 
the people and their daughter live downstairs. So, you know, a few days after the first sighting of this, I went out back, just, uh, you know, sit out back and enjoy the night. And the neighbor girl was outside, and she was in the ghost and all that. And, you know, I told her, I saw something the other night. And I said, I couldn't quite make it out. And she was like, well, what did you see? And, you know, I explained it to her. She just looked at me with this face, like, you saw them too. And I'm like, saw what? And she's like, well, what did you see? And, you know, like I said, I explained it to her. And she's like, no, nah, no. Nah. She said, that's nothing like what I saw. And I asked her, like, well, what did you see? And she said, like, well, down at the tree line, which is at the bottom of the property, it was about, I'd say, 50 to 60 yards from where her and I were sitting. She pointed out the tree line to me. And she said, on some nights down there, you'll see pairs of red eyes looking up at you. She said, there was one night she saw three of them. And she said, like, I didn't know what they were. And she said, it never came up this way. But I was told never to go down that way. Just strange things. Because I know down by this creek that's not too far from where I sighted this creature and where she saw these red eyes at, there's stories of a Mothman type creature being down there where it's, you know, completely black and it has red eyes. And I believe there's a few investigators trying to figure out what these things are. I mean, it could be coincidence, but you never know with these cryptids. It could be anywhere. That's true. They could be. And I'll bet you more people around you than you know have seen them, but kept their experiences to themselves. Right. But I talked to her the second time after my second encounter there on the road. And I gave her a good visual of what I saw. And she's like, well, there was some animal that was hit by a car in that area. And she said, they said it was a bobcat. And I'm like, I saw it wasn't a bobcat. And I asked her, I was like, can you tell me where this was hit at? And she's told me exactly in the area where I had my first and second sightings at. So I happened to go down there when she told me the day after that she said I was hit by a car. I went to the spot and I could see where, you know, you could see the blood, you could see fur but the animal wasn't there. And here in Pennsylvania, when something gets hit by a car, it usually lays there on the side of the road for a week, maybe two. Sometimes it'll lay there for three or four months. But the day after she said this thing was hit, it was gone. All you could see was some hair and some blood. And it was a brown fur. But it was definitely not a bobcat because bobcats have the stub tails. And what I saw was about two and a half foot bushy tail. So, I mean, it just sounds like somebody didn't want it to be seen. But I haven't seen this creature since. You mentioned Mothman sightings just a bit ago. Do you think some Jersey Devil sightings might have actually been Dogman sightings? Well, yeah, possibly. Because... When I first saw this creature on the first encounter, I couldn't wrap my head around what it was. So I Googled the Jersey Devil in my area. And actually, there was a story that did come up in the early 1900s of where a weird creature that resembled the Jersey Devil injured some dogs in the area. And there was a posse that was sent to go find it, but it was never found, of course. But there were some dogs that were injured and killed. Yeah, at times, dog meat can be pretty hard on dogs, so that might be what was responsible for it. Of course, we're never going to know, but it's possible. You found something strange in Kedora State Park that you think might have been dog meat related. 
Please expand on that for us. Okay. This place is one of my favorite fishing spots. Well, that's where I like to go hiking, and that's where I do some hunting. It's a small game. Well, there's this one spot where I like to go fishing, and this is a place where I just like to sit and just reflect on things. Well, I pulled into this parking spot. I saw branches down on the ground, and this tree was right by a public restroom. And this branch, it must have been about 12 feet long, and the branch had to have been about five or six inches wide. So, of course, I got really curious about this. And so I went down to this tree, and I was looking at the branch, I was looking up, and I reached up towards this branch, and I'm a pretty big guy, I'm six foot five, and if I reach my arm way above my head, I can reach up to eight feet. Now, this broken branch, it had to have been nine feet up because I couldn't touch it. So it just made me think that possibly a dog man was making its mark. I mean, I took pictures of it with my phone, just for my uh, personal records. And there was a branch in that same vicinity on a pine tree, and I saw it was broken off about 12 feet up. I mean, it's just weird to me. It's like, I can't think of anybody trying to go up that high just to break a branch. It's like something is trying to make a mark. You did notice any signs of maybe a windstorm that might have caused that damage or anything else to explain that away? Well, it was in the middle of winter. We did have a snow, but the branch being like five or six inches wide, I mean, you couldn't really think of any snow really accumulating on there enough to snap. You never know, but it's just something that stuck out to me. It just, it just didn't set right with me. That's true. You never do know, but if the branch was that big, then yeah, that does cut down on the chances of it actually being a snow load busting it like that. You've had some strange experiences while night fishing. Please talk us through those experiences. Well, first, I'll tell you a little story that happened to me last summer about where I like to go fishing. It's called Cador State Park, and it's great catfishing at nighttime. And plus, at nighttime, there's hardly anybody out there. It's just night fishermen, either you're on a boat or you're on the bank. But a bank fisherman, that's not too many of us out there. Well, this one night last summer, I'm fishing out there alone. And right behind me where I parked is this parking lot. It's about maybe 30 yards from the bank. And right behind that is the ranger station. That's about... 60 yards from my fishing spot. I mean, it's pretty visible, and I can see them, and they can see me. As when you fish out there at night, they prefer that you are in sight. You know, they don't want you running through the woods at night or anything. They just want you to be in sight so that they can see you and make sure you're not doing anything illegal. Well, I'm fishing there this one night last summer, and I hear this, they mind if I join you, and I look up, and it's a former co-worker of mine. I'm like, yeah, sure, man, you know, the more the merrier. So we're just fishing there for about an hour, and the crickets are chirping, the fish are jumping, you hear the bullfrogs. I mean, it was just full of life out there. But I would stand up a few times, and I would actually scan tree line to my left, which was about 80 yards away, and I'll talk about that in my next encounter, and um, you could tell that I was scanning for something, and I sat back down to tend to my fishing rod, and he asked me, can I tell you a story? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. I thought it was a good old fishing story, and he said, well... Last week, I was fishing down at Cunningham Falls, down outside of Fairmont. And he said, 
my friend and I were sitting there fishing, and it was starting to get dark out. And he said, off in the distance, I could hear the goat making its noises. And he said, the next thing he knows, he just hears this goat just screeching and screaming like something was killing it. And he said, he could hear what sounded like it being torn apart. And he said, it was so loud. Then the noise stopped. But he said about five minutes later, he heard what he described as something running through the woods, breaking branches, and panting really loud. He said it was just so loud that he couldn't hear anything else around him. And he said what him and his friend did, and this really impressed me. He said they stood back to back. And they went around in a circle to scan what was going on around them. And he said, while this panning was going on, he looked right in front of them at 12 o'clock. He said he saw these two amber eyes just staring at him about 50 yards away, coming from the tree line. And he said at his 2 o'clock, he saw another pair of amber eyes, and they were about five feet off the ground, while the other one was about eight feet off the ground. And he said this noise just kept going and going, and he kept his eyes on these things. Then they gradually went back into the woods, but he said he can hear them running away, just breaking branches and panting, and he said it just scared the crap out of him. And when he first started telling me the story, and he mentioned the goat, I thought he was going to tell me a goat man story because that's another cryptid that's known to be down there in Maryland. I mean, there's quite a few stories about it down there. I mean, there's actually a bridge down there that I believe it's called Cry Baby Bridge where there are known goat man sightings. There's quite a few other spots down there too I like to try. When your coworker was relating that experience to you, did you notice any body language he was displaying that seemed to convey anxiety, increasing the likelihood that what he was telling you was true? Well, I can tell that it bothered him a lot. I mean, he actually started to shiver about it. And from knowing this guy and being around him, I actually trained him at my job at work, and he was the honest type of guy. I mean, it's just the way he was talking about it, the way it bothered him. I mean, it, it just had to have been true. I believe him. And he just seemed so scared about it. And he asked me what I thought it might have been. And this was about you know, three months after I started studying Dogman. And, you know, of course, I didn't tell him what I thought it was because I really didn't know much about them at the time. But he said that was, you know, his spot. He was going to continue to fish there. I mean, people in this area, in Pennsylvania, Maryland, I mean, we're serious about our fishing and our hunting. I mean, I don't think anything can scare us from the woods. <laughs> oh, I believe it. It sounds like relating that experience to you, that sounds like it must have helped him, which that's obviously a good thing. Right. I mean, it's like with me, when I first called your show, when you and I first talked about it, I was actually letting a lot out because I've talked to people about my ghost hunting experiences. You know, they believe it or they don't. But when you talk about something like Dog Man, that's a totally different subject there. I mean, that's, you know, a cryptid and people are like, okay, you saw a giant werewolf, whatever. I mean, it's not something I actually talk to a lot of people about. But, you know, talking to you about this weekend right now, I feel comfortable talking to you about it. I mean, you do a very good job of what you do. Well, I'm so glad that having the conversations that we had have actually helped you. That's what this is all about, and that's why I do what I do. You said you had another experience while night fishing. What happened that time? Okay, this was back in June of this year. It was the second week. And thinking about those broken branches which I didn't see any tracks, by the way. 
I mean, the snow was really, it was lightly melted away. I mean, there were some spots. I mean, it wasn't totally covered the ground, but I didn't see any tracks, by the way. When I started night fishing out there this year, which is in the middle of June, that's when bass season comes in. And when it gets hot out, you catch more fish out there at nighttime. And plus, there's hardly anybody out there to bother you. It's just relaxing and mellow. Or so you think. Unlike the first time when I was fishing with my coworker out there where the night was completely alive, this night when I had this experience, I mean, it was just dead out there. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, you could hear a fish jump about 100 yards away. I mean, the sound was just, you could hear everything around you. But not one bug, not one bullfrog or anything. So, it's maybe about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And now this is a place where, remember, behind me is the ranger station about 60 yards away. And the tree line where I saw this is about 80 yards away. So, I'm sitting there fishing. And off to my left, I hear a branch break. Not a twig, but a branch. So, at the time, I had a tactical flashlight, which is pretty bright. And I was carrying a forty-five. So, when I heard this noise coming from the left, I stood up out of my seat. And I held the flashlight up in my left hand. And I had my right hand on my handgun. I didn't pull it. I just had my hand on it just in case. So I have the light, and I'm scanning the tree line, and it was pretty thick with brush. But once I came up to this path that the hikers take, I saw this amber eye looking right at me. And I... Watched it for about 10 seconds and it wouldn't move. So I turned my light off and I'm just there standing and listening and observing. And I didn't hear anything for about 5 or 10 minutes. And I sit back down in my seat. Next thing you know, I hear a lot of commotion coming from where I heard this sound at. And I heard more sticks and branches breaking. And I'm like, okay. It wants me out of here. So I packed my things up, and I put it in my car. And as I was backing up, and I turned my high beams on, and I scanned the tree line where I saw this thing. I to see if I can get a better view of it, but it wasn't there. So I went to a spot on the other side of where I was fishing at, which is about 300 yards away. So, you know, I get my fishing stuff out of the car, and I'm there for about an hour, and there was a guy next to me, and I looked over to my left to where I was fishing at and up above where the ranger station is. I see not one, not two, but three flashlights coming down the driveway from the ranger station, and they are shining in all directions. And I couldn't make out what they were screaming, but it sounded like it was like, it went over here, it went over there, it went over there. And they were there for about 15 minutes, just shining their flashlights around. And they gradually went back up to the ranger station. And it made me think that whatever I saw over there, where I was fishing before, it went up to the ranger station and it messed with them or something. Because, I mean, what would cause three park rangers to run out of a building like that, frantically shining their flashlights in all directions? That's true, but if those three rangers knew what was quite possibly in those woods, I don't think they would have been out there looking for it. Right. I mean, it was just crazy. I'm like... So I'm not seeing things. But the thing that gets me, though, is, and I've thought about this, 
I only saw one eye. I don't know if it had like one eye shut and the other one open or if it's missing the other eye because it got into a fight with another dog man or if somebody tried to shoot it and hit it in the eye. I'm not sure. But the whole thing, when I saw this dog man, it's like, okay, there's one, but are there any more? And that there, Vic, is what scares me the most. Because, I mean, if I have to deal with four or five of them, you can pretty much put me in the deadpan. Oh, I understand. Yeah, that is a pretty disconcerting thought. Unfortunately, yeah, they don't always move alone. Sometimes they do travel in numbers. Well, it's like the encounter I told you about back in the early 90s. You hear that sound coming from deep in the woods. Or when you're across the road, you hear from, like, the other side of the road. That there possibly could have been more of them just waiting to ambush us. That's the scariest thing about these things. You don't know if there's more of them. Yeah, it's possible. That just might be what was going on. We'll never know, though. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Joe. Before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yes, I do. If you're a sportsman, whether you hunt, you fish, or you hike, always be aware of your surroundings. Make sure you know what's going on around you. And if possible, have a friend or two with you. Well, that sounds like really good advice to me. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show tonight and telling us all about those experiences, Joe. I appreciate it. Thanks, Vic. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, you know you're welcome. Well, thanks again so much. Have a good night. Okay, you too. Bye, Vic. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.